welcome to the Voc Talk Cafe, where we get to chat live about teaching a trade in today's world. Um, so my name is Robin. I am the pedagogical consultant for um, Proceed, and I work with all nine English language school boards in vocational training. We have with us as well, Marc Vizina. You want to say hi? Hello. Who is the uh, regional consultant for uh, the Récit VT? And we have Richard Pinchot with us as well, who is our uh, technical uh, support and uh, development agent for the Apricot, the Voxar Cafe by Apricot. So these are your presenters. A little word before we get started. Um, on the Apricot Apric vocational training website, you're going to find all the resources available. So there will be the meetings and the agenda are at the top right. Uh, any resources we share will be shared in the resource library. You can, once again, the calendar of the different uh, Voc Talk cafes coming up. You can subscribe to the calendar and have it synced to your uh, work calendar. And then of all the, the recordings and the summaries and the archives are in the individual uh, uh, articles. So everything that you find today will be on this website. So remember, uh, this is a pilot project. So anything you have to say is worth listening to. We want to hear your suggestions. We want to hear your, uh, your ideas. This is it's really important to create the space for you. So go ahead and let us know. Uh, today, November 13th, we are going to be talking with the manufacturing sector and we're going to talk about equipping newcomers with workers, uh, about work, the workforce rights in Canada. And this today, our goal today is to, is, we're doing this in honor of, uh, of the current uh, labor relations that we're experiencing with our public sector workers. And those are uh, the people here also be part of those public sector workers. So we kind of were discussing this and we said, you know, we really want to take a critical perspective of workers' rights and expectations and sort of situate them in a bit of a historical context, as well as a modern day concept, uh, context, and, and mainly, although this is really good information for all workers, we really were thinking about um, our, our newcomers, Canadian new, can newcomers to Canada and our, our immigrant students. We want to identify government websites for support, and we want to discuss, uh, uh, have, a, have a discussion afterwards about labor relations, like how to prepare students to understand this notion of labor and labor relations and workforce like expectations um, when, they, when they do graduate and get into the workforce. So the session breakdown. So the way the session works is we have the first 15 minutes, we have the little presentation where we're going to just introduce a topic and some, some, some elements of interest. Then we have a 40 minute discussion where this is where we ask for your participation and your, your thoughts and ideas. Then we're going to come back and at the very end, we're going to, to have the little five minute tech capsule and then of course open mic. Um, the first uh, presentation bit and the, and the uh, tech capsule are recorded, but the session discussion is not recorded, and that's to preserve a safe space so that everybody can feel comfortable talking. We do take notes um, so that we have access to the information, but uh, that is, it is, it is, uh, we don't identify the notes with any one person. Those notes are available on the Apricot website. Right. right on, Leprechaun. Or my new expression is now... <laughs> Let's get started. All right. So uh, we discussed this because, all right, we have this current labor situation where we are, the public sector workers are going on strike and we're on this half a million people going on strike in the next few, few, few weeks. And it's like, okay, well, let's situate this notion of strikes and unions. And if we look at the historical pr perspective of strikes and unions, trades are where this originated because back at the industrial revolution, we had something called craft unions, which were the trades that the skilled trades that you had to have a skilled trade to be a member of this union and and you had you were fighting for your worker protection and and you know back in the 1800s and early 1900s a lot of that had to do with wage stability of wages let alone wage increase it had to do with stability of wages it had to do with um getting your expertise recognized for certain positions 
Um, it also had to do with uh, having a safe work environment. Um, it had to, I mean, stuff that we completely take for granted today, but like an, an eight hour workday and a scheduled lunch uh, <laughs> and um, not having to work uh, on weekends and um, permanent positions, like things that we take for granted today. This is all fought during then. Then, of course, from the craft unions, the only problem was is they were a little bit exclusionary. People had to have a recognized trade and you had to be from a background that was accepted into this trade. So namely white middle class, well, middle class, middle class for them, but white male workers, usually not foreign born. Um, so there was a lot of exclusionary practices and it left out a huge chunk of the sector, which was the semi-skilled labor. So people like in this case with, with the manufacturing sector, which at this point is sort of a new sector in the early 20th century, these semi-skilled workers, which will eventually become skilled workers. But at this time, these machinists and machine operators could considered semi-skilled. And this is where you get the rise of the industrial unions, which combine both the craft unions and these 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 new worker positions these semi-skilled laborers and combine the two of them and then after world war ii we see these cross trade unions where unions were much more political um, and realized that their strength lied in covering as many workers as possible and not just specific trades which is where we get the rise of our of giant unions that we have today. And so this is sort of the, 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 the perspective that we're doing. And you can see on this, on this, um, on this slide here that the, the Canadian Museum of History actually has an amazing website that goes through the historical perspective of Canadian labor. So if you're interested, that's actually a really great place to, to start. Um, in the current labor situation, so from the the or the organization of economic cooperation and development, which is sort of this para government organization that was that was founded right after World War II, to um, it was actually founded to administer the Marshall Plan. I found that out, which I thought was a nifty little tidbit of information. But their goal is 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 to stimulate economic progress and development through democracy. And so they produce actually a lot of really great reports that have to deal with education. And one of the reports on Canadian the Canadian workforce is it shows that 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 for the future we're looking at these these middle and high so the middle skilled workforce is the one that's kind of dropping and it's the low skill and the high skilled workforce that's increasing and when we look at our trades these are highly skilled jobs and so you know you can look here like the high skilled occupations we're looking at technicians okay so these and machine operators and these types of things so this really is this field so we know that this is going to increase and when we look at the foreign born uh, workforce in Canada, we see that, that, that our education system actually does a really good job of aligning workforce labor expectations and education. So you can see in the little graph that they shared there that, that as far as um, uh, people in the workforce engaging in learning were very high as well as, um, uh, the flexibility for adult learners to learn, but where we're not so great is in the inclusiveness, <laughs> which kind of shocked me when I saw that. I was like, I thought we were, you know, super inclusive, but in the st oops, in the statistics, what they were saying is they were saying that look, twenty two percent of our workforce is foreign born, and if we look at Montreal's population, thirty five percent of Montreal's the Greater Montreal area, the population is born outside of the province. Now these are big numbers, and sixteen percent of our workforce is overqualified for the position that they occupy, which is kind of interesting because if we look at twenty two percent of our workforce being foreign born and sixteen percent of our workforce being overqualified, this could be that although we have good learning pathways, they're not being engaged by 
are 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 um, are are newcomers to the country, and so why are they not being engaged? Are we missing those low literacy and numeracy skills? Is there a problem there where we're not able to transfer that over from the learning that they did in their own country and bring it over here? Or the other thing that the study was saying is that it might be because they're not being prepared properly for the workforce and gaining workforce experience that they can then leverage on their on their CV to be able to get jobs in the field that they want, that they, that they have the education for. So this brought up the idea of like, okay, so, so what are we teaching our students about the labor force? And like, how do we teach this? Like, I know it's easy to focus on content where we're like, I have to teach the students about in my case, cooking, so I got to do that. But I also have to be able to teach them about say in the SST or some of these other websites that exist like Educalua and then in the case of certain trades um, where that are not governed by say in the say in the SST would be Canada's labor laws right and so so am I showing them any of these websites how do I help the students judge oh if there's a you know Mark gave me this example earlier uh, oh, there's a problem on my pay stub. I'm going to call San this is T. And it's like, well, hang on, that seems like a jump. Like, where do I go get the information to know what my rights are, what the workforce is expecting? Where are, where do I fall on this scale? Um, you know, when can I sit with uncomfortableness? When is it, when should I be contacting somebody and who do I contact? Where can I go to get this information? So these are some of the websites and I'm kind of curious, like, which ones do we use? How do we teach our students this? Do we situate our students? Do we situate our trades in a historical perspective or not? Um, so in this, the key takeaways of this is that both, like, both foreign born and local students need to be educated about workforce rights and expectations. But foreign born workers might benefit more about this this historical context of labor than our local guys although that's that's we're not sure about that but that's what some of the data is pointing to so from this that's the end of the presentation so we're going to go ahead and stop the recording uh so every every week at the Voc talk cafe I, I bring some technological pedagogical uh experience and what you're seeing uh, going on on the screen is a uh, uh, capture of uh, virtual uh, reality learning experience developed by a Quebec uh, company. They're called Etherlab. Um, and with the topics of today, it seemed logical to discuss that because it seems to be a way that could be used to teach uh those difficult situations that we were uh talking about uh think about uh, replacing uh, role play or case study situations where we ask the students to read or reenact situation uh interaction in specific contexts think of a, 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 a branching scenario where the students comes into reality and has to face the consequences of the decisions that they make. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, workplace uh, situation in competency one or uh, stash competency, CNASST related topics, uh, inclusion, diversity, dignity, and, and, uh, and equity, conflict resolution. Uh, I remember in professional cooking, we had a, a, a competency called professional relations where this was part of the program. Or uh, of course, initiation to complex procedure that can be costly uh, or a training in dangerous uh, procedures uh, if you're going to put your student in danger if you just switch to the next slide robin you'll will the next video is where the the simulation goes to uh, dealing with fires in the workplace you don't want to set fire in your lab but the virtual reality can be a good uh, way to develop the word the the reflexes make the student practice get the emotional engagement in there because that's uh definitely the main advantage of uh vr it's it's experimental immersive characteristics the participants get engaged in a reality where they can interact with the environment uh and that's probably where uh, the alleged retention of information comes from, because very, very few studies say that 
uh, knowledge acquired through the experience of virtual reality is retained more. Um, it can save on uh, rare equipment if you have only one machine for the whole lab, but other students can practice in the VR at the same time. It creates a safe environment. Nobody just risks to getting burned and it can make the, the learning very interactive. However, we must not uh, forget the difficulties. Nothing replaces the real life experience, the, the odor, the sensation and the stuff, the cost. A VR headset will cost between $300 and $1,000. You need stronger computers than what we have in the classrooms. <laughs> <Yeah. usually. laughs> make that reality uh, happen. And some for some users also, there are physical weird sensations when facing this. So it's not a, you, it's your case, yeah. It's, uh, so it's definitely not a, a, a blanket solution that solves many problems, but one can imagine that in many of the situations that we talked about, it could be def, uh, a good learning option. And that's what I wanted to bring this week. Okay. All right. Thanks, Mark. To continue the discussion, you can go to the vt.proceed.ca site and join your group, and you can continue your discussion with your colleagues across the province uh, in, in your group tile. And if you have any, uh, if you need assistance with the site, just use the little chat bot, go straight to my phone, and I can give you assistance. Um, thank you for coming. And if you would fill out the exit ticket to let us know how your appreciation of this session, it would be great. It provides us feedback so we know how to, uh, how to adapt these uh, VokTok cafes to meet your needs. Um, if you have an idea, please let us know about uh, what, if, if you want to host a VokTok cafe, we can help you set it up. And of course, there's our contact information. If you want to get a hold of us for anything, if you want Mark to come and discuss VR stuff for you, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah. The resources to some of the some of the uh, items I use to be able to do the presentation are there. And next week, November twentieth, we have our next Voc Talk Cafe. Most likely another one on labor relations, but this time with the healthcare sector because we're going to kind of do a series on these. Um, since we're dealing with them with uh, labor relations in, in the media, we might do a series of these for the different uh, trades. And that's it. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.